Tonight, protest panic. Demonstrations turn violent in India as police forces fail at quelling riots and clashes. The call for justice slowly drowning under unrest. A holy journey. The Pope arrives in Indonesia from Rome to better promote interfaith peace and collaboration in his longest planned visit to the region. Pushing for peace. Israel's Netanyahu in the hot seat as US President Biden expresses the need for more focus on ceasefire efforts in Gaza. And time for a swim. Enthusiasts, young and old, gather at the canals of Copenhagen to participate in a luminous yet nocturnal swimming experience. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We have a packed bulletin to get through for this evening, including regional updates and more. And we begin with continuing updates on India. Violent clashes broke out once more between police and protesters in the Indian state of West Bengal. The protesters were demanding justice for a trainee doctor who was brutally raped and murdered in Kolkata in early August. It was one of several demonstrations by Janata Party workers which were met with tear gas and water cannons as it was when the demonstrators crashed through a police barrier and marched towards the district's magistrate's residence. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP is in opposition in the eastern state and had previously called for a 12-hour statewide protest strike in August. Thousands of doctors, many of them on strike since the 9th of August crime was discovered, also marched in the state's capital of Kolkata. Rallying outside state police headquarters demanding the resignation of the state police chief over vandalism in hospitals and alleged tampering of evidence. India's Modi arrived in Brunei's capital greeted by the Crown Prince. Upon arrival in the Brunei capital of Bandar Seri Begawan, Modi was given a ceremonial welcome and received by Crown Prince Al Mohtadi Billah. Modi is the first Indian premier to make a bilateral visit to Brunei, a country located on the island of Borneo that is home to an Indian diaspora of about 14,000. Modi was set to inaugurate the new building of the Indian High Commission and visit the Omar Ali Saifuddin Mosque, which is a national landmark that incorporates elements of the Mughal architecture. Modi will hold talks with Hasnal Bolkaya, the Sultan and Prime Minister of Brunei, that are expected to focus on cooperation in areas such as space and energy. From Brunei, Modi will travel to Singapore late tomorrow. India and Singapore are set to unveil about half a dozen of agreements during the visit, including one on cooperation in creating a semiconductor ecosystem. Modi's visit will build on a meeting last month of the India-Singapore Ministerial Roundtable, which identified advanced manufacturing and connectivity as new areas for collaboration. Still in the region, Pope Francis landed in the Indonesian capital Jakarta, kicking off a historic trip to Southeast Asia. He will also travel to Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste and Singapore as part of his visit, which is expected to focus on interreligious harmony. The 12-day trip will mark the longest time the pontiff has spent away from the Vatican. It may be the world's most populous majority Muslim country, but Pope Francis's visit to Indonesia has been much anticipated. Aged 87 and in waning health, Pope Francis has embarked on a 12-day, 32,000-kilometer tour of Southeast Asia. His first engagement will be an address to political leaders on Wednesday. One major theme will likely be climate change in a city struggling with air pollution, flooding and sinking land. And on Thursday, the pontiff will hold meetings at the largest mosque in Southeast Asia with leaders from the country's six official religious communities where interfaith tolerance will be high on the agenda. Eight million Catholics live in Indonesia, a 97% Muslim country. As such, a major focus of the visit will be promoting dialogue between Islam and Christianity at a time when religious animosity is on the rise in the country. While in town, the Holy Father will also say outdoor mass in a stadium of 80,000 seats. His epic voyage will then take him on to Papua New Guinea, East Timor and Singapore. 
Hong Kong's flagship airline, Cathay Pacific, has cancelled tens of flights after a plane heading from the city to Zurich was forced to turn around due to an engine component failure. The company says it has now inspected all 48 of its Airbus A350s and found 15 aircrafts with faulty parts that needed to be replaced. The plane's Trent XWB-97 engines were made by British engineering giant Rolls-Royce. Since Monday, Cathay Pacific has cancelled almost 70 flights, including routes linking Hong Kong to Sydney, Singapore, Bangkok, Tokyo, Seoul and Taipei. Cathay Pacific said the disruptions will continue until at least Saturday. Cathay Pacific took delivery of its first Airbus A350 aircraft in 2016. Rolls-Royce stated that it is committed to working closely with the airline, aircraft manufacturer and the relevant authorities to support their efforts. Cathay Pacific's A350s also serve destinations in Europe and North America. In a statement, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency said in its monitoring any information coming out of the technical investigation and will take decisions on any fleet-level action as required. Other airlines that operate A350s include British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, Qatar Airways, Singapore Airways and Japan Airlines. A school bus crashed into a crowd in China. The incident caused over 10 fatalities, including five students. Several others were injured, including some in critical condition. It was also confirmed that six parents are among the dead and 12 other casualties who are in stable condition. Images and videos of the incident are being shared on social media, showing people appearing to be trapped under the vehicle. The bus appears to have rammed into the students and parents as they were standing outside the gates of a school in Taiyan City. State media report that the driver had lost control of the vehicle and was taken into custody as police investigate the cause of the incident. It is unclear if the incident was intentional. Dozens of MPOX patients are crammed into large plastic isolation tents as the East Democratic Republic of Congo struggles at the epicenter of the outbreak. Medicine shortages and overstretched hospital workers are stunting the progress towards controlling what is now a global public health emergency. Lying on thin mattresses on damp earth, this is an overcrowded makeshift MPOX isolation ward in East Democratic Republic of Congo. The country is the epicentre of the global public health emergency declared by the World Health Organisation last month. Overstretched hospital workers grapple with drug shortages and lack of space to accommodate the influx of patients. In Kavumu, 900 symptomatic patients, like Sifa Mwakasisi, have been taken in over the past three months. The head of the Congo's MPOX response team acknowledged that parts of the vast country lacked medicine. He added that dispatching donations, including 115 tonnes of medicine from the World Bank, was a priority. Relatives, who usually provide the bulk of meals in underfunded public facilities, were banned from visiting the MPOX ward to avoid contamination. Basic treatment is also a challenge. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, with only two months left in the U.S. presidential race, nominees Kamala Harris and Donald Trump ramped up their campaigns in major swing states, with U.S. President Joe Biden joining Harris over the weekend. Kamala Harris spent the Labor Day holiday campaigning in two key states, Michigan and Pennsylvania. With just two months to go until Election Day, the Democratic nominee is trying to sway unions and blue-collar workers. We celebrate unions because unions helped build America and unions helped build America's middle class. There are at least seven swing states and for his part, Donald Trump and his running mate have events planned in Nevada, North Carolina and Arizona this week. Over the weekend, the former president and Republican nominee held a rally in Pennsylvania where he lobbed personal attacks against his opponent. 
if you look at Kamala and you look at what she's done to every place she's touched has turned to sh With the campaigns in high gear, they are now in the final stretch to election day. Early voting in some states begins this week on September 6th. On September 10th, Harris and Trump face off in their first and possibly only televised debate. Then on September 18th, attention turns back to Trump's legal issues when he's due in court to be sentenced in his New York hush money case, in which prison time could be a possibility. Meanwhile, polls show that for voters in the swing states, the economy remains their number one concern. But polls also show that the issue of abortion is central to how they will cast their ballots. On October 1st, vice presidential nominees Tim Walls and J.D. Vance will face off on the debate stage. All of this leading up to Election Day on November 5th. Updates on the war in Gaza now. U.S. President Joe Biden said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wasn't doing enough to get a deal to release Hamas held hostages in Gaza. Netanyahu said pressure should be applied to Hamas, not Israel, particularly after the hostages' deaths. Over the weekend, Israeli forces recovered the bodies of six hostages from a tunnel in Gaza. Among them, 23 year old American Israeli Hirsch Goldberg Polin. Israel's military said they had been killed recently by Palestinian Hamas militants. The developments have sparked criticism of the Biden administration's Gaza ceasefire strategy. <laughs> Meanwhile, Israelis are also ramping up pressure on Netanyahu. <laughs> Protesters took to the streets again on Monday, staying out late into the night in Tel Aviv. The pressure internationally must be directed at these killers, at Hamas. Not at Israel. Netanyahu appeared to push back when asked about Biden's comments. We're asked to make concessions? What message does this send Hamas? It says, kill more hostages, murder more hostages, you'll get more concessions. Venezuela's Attorney General's office said a court has issued an arrest warrant for opposition leader Edmundo Gonzalez, accusing him of conspiracy and other crimes amid a dispute over whether he or President Nicolas Maduro won a July election. News of the warrant came from the country's Attorney General's office on Monday, which shared a photo of the document. The warrant accuses Gonzalez of conspiracy and other crimes. Maduro spoke on state television after news of the warrant broke, calling Gonzalez a, quote, cowardly man. An arrest warrant against Gonzalez would amount to a major escalation in Maduro's government's crackdown against the opposition following the disputed July 28th election which has included detentions of opposition figures and protesters. A Gonzalez spokesperson said they were awaiting any notification of a warrant, but made no further comment. The opposition has denied any wrongdoing. The warrant request came hours after the Biden administration said an aircraft used by Maduro had been confiscated in the Dominican Republic. Washington determined that its purchase violated U.S. sanctions while the Venezuelan government slammed the move as an act of piracy. And finally tonight, swimmers of all ages and nationalities completed a two-kilometer night swim through the canals of central Copenhagen. Fluorescent boys attached to over 550 swimmers lit up on the water as the sun set over Christiansburg Palace, which houses the Danish parliament, one of the attractions which could be seen on the road. The night swim was a social non-competitive event and lifeguards on bodyboards and in boards were on standby. The event was part of the annual Trifond in Copenhagen Swim, a series of competitive and recreational swimming events that take place over two days in Copenhagen's harbour. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Anurabi with Kimasingha will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.